Grace and peace in Dios Les Bendiga Hickman Community Church. Welcome to our online worship service for Sunday, April 19th, 2020. Here are a few ways to stay informed and keep connected to Hickman Community Church while we're apart. You can start by wishing these people happy birthday this week. Larry Texera, Dave Harris, Erica Segura, Lily Weikert, Gary Littlefield, and Beth Bond. So happy birthday to each of you, and may the Lord bless you truly this year. Well, a way that you all have been staying connected with the church is through giving. Your giving is allowing us to meet our budget needs. We're so grateful to you for giving, and we know that the Lord has used you in that regard. So thank you. Please continue to give, and you know that you can do so online, dropping it in the mail, or simply bringing it by the office. Well, here are some other ways to connect with one another. First of all, the men's ministry. Men's ministry is hosting live online Bible studies. So if you desire to be a part of that, uh, you can contact either Josh Taylor or Sam Van Dyke and they'll help point you in the right direction for that. Next is the yard sale. As you know, it's coming May 15th and 16th. That's a Friday and Saturday. Contact Alyssa Cotta for any delivery instructions. And then also at the end of the month, May 30th at 1130 a.m. will be our Women's Spring Luncheon. If you have any questions about that, please contact Kim Calloway. Also, don't forget that the food pantry is open every Sunday from noon to 1245. Finally, we wanted to make sure that you knew that due to the activity slowing down around here at Hickman Community Church, the office will be closed on Mondays as well as Fridays. But if you have any needs at all, please don't hesitate to contact us at the office. There are many people who wanna serve you and meet any need that you might have. But again, please know that your elders are praying for you and we trust that you are sheltering in the Lord during this difficult time. So until we meet again, be sure to be on the lookout for more emails, blogs, and videos from us to come. Thank you for worshiping online with us today. Hello, and welcome to today's reading of the Word of God, where we will be in Psalm 12, verses 1 through 8. If you have your Bibles, please open them. While you're going there, let me share this with you. This is a Psalm of David, and he is asking God uh, for his help against the hurtful and destructive words of the unrighteous, because the godly cease to be. Their words are false, flattering, boastful, and deceiving. So with their words, they believe that they will prevail. So let us go to Psalm 12, starting in verse 1. Help, Lord, for the godly man ceases to be, for the faithful disappear from among the sons of men. They speak falsehood to one another. With flattering lips, with a double heart, they speak. May the Lord cut off all flattering lips, the tongue that speaks great things, who have said, with our tongues, we will prevail. Our lips are our own, who is Lord over us. Because of the devastation of the afflicted, because of the groaning of the needy, now I will arise, says the Lord. I will set him in the safety for which he longs. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace on the earth, refined seven times. You, O Lord, will keep them. You will preserve him from this generation forever. The wicked strut about on every side, when vileness is exalted among the sons of men. Would you please pray with me? Lord, we gather this Lord's Day to give to you worship. With hearts prepared and centered on the truth of the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. We confess that you are the one true God. God the Father, 
God the Son, and God the Spirit, and are sovereign over all things in this creation. By your providence, we know that you cause all things to work together for good to those who love you and to those who are called according to your purpose to be conformed to the image of our Lord Jesus Christ. The life you have given us here on earth is like a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. We can endure even this, the times of sickness, trials, and temptations because of the certainty of our eternal home, heaven. All the things of this world are temporal and passing away, and we seek the imper imperishable and the eternal blessings of heaven. For those who confess Jesus as Lord and believe in his resurrection will be saved. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given to man by which we must be saved. Only Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Our only way into the presence of God the Father. Jesus is the only perfect sacrifice for our sins. The sacrificial lamb who is worthy to put in full, pay in full, our debt of sin before a holy God. I ask for your protection over your children, Lord, that our hearts would not be hardened during these trying times, but that you will continue to sanctify us leading us by the Holy Spirit that we may be your servants, living according to your word, spending time in our communion with you in prayer. Would you, Lord, give us strength for the path that you have put before us? It is narrow and at many times difficult, but we know Jesus has promised to never leave us or forsake us. You are a patient and a loving God, and there is nothing that can separate us from your love, which is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. And we pray these things to the glory of God, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us sing of the assurance that we have in Christ and his finished work. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand.
Thank you for the assurance that we have, Lord, that the work that Christ has done stands for all time. There is nothing that can separate us from your love, which you have shown in your son. Lord, help us to trust in that, to stand upon that. Lord, may we have no other plea. May we trust in Christ and Christ alone, we ask in his name. Well, good morning, Hickman Community Church. It's good to be back together again, even if it is online. I want to welcome you to this online worship service. I'm so grateful to the music team and thankful for the, the, the hymns that we're able to sing, and I thank them for the time they put in to uh, do that as well, and also for all those involved in making this online service possible. Well, I trust that all of you are living in the grace of God. I trust that you are growing in faith and grace through this time where we can't meet faith face to face. But may our fellowship this morning as we come to the Word of God be uh, encouraging and strengthening to our faith. I want you to know that the elders are, even as I am speaking, are preparing a process for reopening Hickman Community Church, and that we are looking at uh, maybe doing some things a little differently as we come back together in order to mitigate against the, any possible spread of this virus. So please pray for us, pray for wisdom, uh, that the Lord will help us to direct this process as we're enabled to do that in the future. Well, for this morning, please take your Bibles and let's open God's Word together to Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. And as we come to Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12 through 19, we come to a sober warning against unbelief. Please read along with me uh, in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12 through 19. The author of Hebrews, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says this, Take Hear, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God, but encourage one another day after day as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. While it is still, while it is said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me. For who provoked him when they had heard? Indeed, did not all those who came out of Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who had sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? And so we see that they were not able to enter because of unbelief. Let's ask God's blessing on the study of this portion of his word. Father, as we bow this morning in your presence, we ask that you would bless this word uh, that you would speak to our hearts, that you would stir us, Lord, to be people of faith. That, that, Lord, indeed, we would not be like these people, that we would learn from the examples of those who've gone before us, that we would learn not to be unbelieving, that we would learn, Lord God, to trust you with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, and all of our, our strength. And so, God, bless the study of your word we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, let me remind you as we begin that the author is writing to Hellenistic Jewish Christian readers. Uh, these are the ones uh, who were being tempted under persecution to go back to their old ways of Judaism. They, they were thinking along the lines of, if we could just go back temporarily to Judaism, 
then we wouldn't be as, as persecuted and we'll be able to come back and follow Christ at a later time. They thought that they could accept Jesus as Messiah all over again and that, that doing that, this new salvation would erase any sin of apostasy that they might be stepping into. The author of this letter makes it clear, however, through five independent warning passages in this Simonic letter that that was not an option. And our passage this morning is the second warning passage, and it's a strong warning based on the historical example of Israel's unbelief following their exodus from Egypt. The author has quoted here in verses 7 through 11 leading up to our passage, a quote from Psalm 95, which looked back to the unbelief of the nation of Israel. Faith in God matters. Faith in God day by day matters. Because not to live by faith means that we will miss out, like the nation of Israel, on the blessings of God. As Jesus said, a man who puts his hand to the plow and looks back, that's unbelief. That man, Jesus said, is not fit for the kingdom of God. What we have just read this morning is a strong exhortation calling Christians to an enduring faith, not to go down the pathway of unbelief leading to apostasy and temporal judgment. Now, when it comes to our salvation, I want you to understand that I believe that saving faith is a gift of God. Ephesians chapter 2, 8, 9 tells us that. It is imparted to us when God saves us, when He regenerates us by the Holy Spirit. Salvation, therefore, originates with God, and it depends totally on His purpose and His power to perform it and to keep it. Since He promises to complete what He began to the praise of His glorious grace, all of God's elect will, listen, will persevere in faith unto eternal life. Now, this is not to say that persevering faith is passive or effortless or somehow automatic. God, the Bible says, makes it clear, ordains the means as well as the ends of our faith. And what we discover in the Scripture is God's sovereignty and salvation never negates human responsibility. God elects all whom He saves, but the elect are responsible to repent of their sins and believe in Jesus Christ and take up a cross and by faith follow Him day by day. Although God promises that His elect will all finally be saved, we are all exhorted to persevere in our faith. How do we do that? We do that by believing in the power and the promises of God. And not to do so, as I've already said, means that we will find ourselves outside of the blessings of God. We'll find ourselves under His judgment. God's sovereignty and, God and human responsibility are never at odds with each other. But they work together for the glory of God. So in light of human responsibility then, our text this morning is a strong exhortation to believers to persevere in the faith. Genuine believers will heed the warning in this passage, and they will hold fast their faith. That's the encouragement in the midst of this exhortation. So in our passage, we will, we will find that there are four exhortations that I want to bring to you, three specific, one implied, that will, when obeyed, help you to persevere in the faith. So again, we're going to look at these four exhortations to help you and me persevere in believing and trusting in a God who only wants the best for us. The first exhortation that we discover is in verse 12, 
And it, it is that believers should take care to avoid the sin of unbelief. Right there in verse 12, take care, he says, brethren, that's believers, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. Now, there are three things that this, reveal, this verse reveals about how we avoid unbelief. And the first is we avoid unbelief when we take care. We could say when we take great care. Literally, this idea of taking care is to, to look out. It's, it's to be vigilant. It's to be on guard. The invitation to take care is also a present active verb, which means what well, we must be on guard at all times. It's like, it's like the local policeman who goes out on a call, and when he approaches the situation, he has his antennas up. He is on guard. He's vigilant. He's ready for whatever situation he may face. Or to use a woodworking analogy, measure twice, cut once. We must be this kind of person. We must be about taking care in order to avoid unbelief. And the author, the, the, the author here is calling you to be vigilant and to be on guard. We are to be alert towards any, any shred of unbelief in our hearts, any any amount of unbelief that might creep into our hearts. Notice that this call to take care, however, is not just to look out for our own lives, our own hearts, but it's also, it's a broader look here. It's to look out for the hearts of others as well. He mentions this phrase, any one of you. Take care, lest there be in any one of you. He's writing to a church, and this is a call to be aware of anyone within the congregation who might be exhibiting unbelief. Why? Because one person in the church can have a great influence on the whole church. A little leaven of unbelief, a little sin of unbelief, if you like, will ultimately permeate the whole church. especially those who are immature and the weak, those who are not strong in the faith. It's, it's the careless who find themselves in spiritual danger. Listen, you don't have to be careful. You don't have to take care to arrive in hell. All you have to do is just let the strong current of the world, the flesh, and the devil operate on your heart and your mind, and it will sweep you. They will sweep you right into hell and judgment. Jesus said it this way. He said, strive to enter through the narrow door, for many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. We need to take care, friends. We need to be vigilant. This is a call to spiritual vigilance. Secondly, to avoid unbelief, we must understand how evil it really is. And there are many reasons why unbelief is so evil. Think about these with me, because firstly, it leads to a dead religion worshiping dead idols. Notice the author says in verse 12 here, he speaks about and defines God as the living God. And that sets God apart from all other gods, little g. The gods of the nations were dead gods. They were idols fashioned by, uh, by craftsmen, made out of gold or silver or stones or, or some other precious material. As Psalm 115 says, the, their idols are silver and gold, the work of man's hands. They have mouths, but they cannot speak. They have eyes, but they cannot see. They have ears, but they cannot hear. They have noses, but they cannot smell. Idols are man-made objects or ideas that are powerless, that cannot accomplish anything. They are idols fashioned in the human mind and worked out through the human hand, and they are a collection of lifeless imaginations fueled by demonic and fleshly thinking which the unbelieving nations worship. Now, Christian, beware. 
Because through unbelief, you too can fall prey to the attractiveness of these dead and lifeless idols. For example, the idol of comfort, the idol of ease, the idol of self-esteem and self-righteousness. And all of these things offer something that cannot deliver. They promise much, but because they're dead, they deliver little. They all appeal, do they not, to the lusts of our flesh, which the Bible says wages war against the soul and war against the spirit of the living God. The tragic failure for the Christian is to follow idols, dead gods, which lead, as he says in this verse, to a falling away from the living God. You can't be following that which is dead while at the same time following that which is living. The Greek word for falling away here is the word from which we get apostatize, and it means to abandon a former relationship. And in our verse, that relationship is a relationship with the living God. Those who depart from the living God are therefore preferring something else, and there's only one other thing, and that's death. You either love life or you love death. You either pursue the living God or you pursue dead imaginations and idols. Listen, true faith looks to the living God who comes into this world in the person of his son, who by his own death took the sting out of sin and rose victorious over death. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is God incarnate, as this sermonic letter has made very clear to us. He is the living God wrapped in human flesh. He is alive forevermore. He is not dead. Another reason why unbelief is so evil is because it's the root of all sins that we commit. When Satan tempted Eve in the garden, he got her to disbelieve the word of God. He said, indeed, has God said you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? Genesis 3.1. In other words, he's saying, come on now, you, you really don't believe that, do you? See, unbelief in God and his promises leads us to walk outside of the truth. And that's what sin is. It's a distortion. It's a twisting of what is true into something that becomes a falsehood. He says, you surely will not die. Unbelief makes us think there will be no consequences for our sin. When all along God has said sin is corruption, corruption leads to death, and God has never changed his position. Another reason why unbelief is evil is because it hardens the heart. In verse 13, unbelief leads to sin, and sin hardens the hearts. He says here, so none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. A hard heart is a heart that's not sensitive to God. It's not sensitive to the leading of the Spirit. The conscience that God has given you is the warning light, and it's to be trained and molded by the truth and the presence of the Spirit of God in our lives. When you harden your heart, you ignore your conscience, and that would be as foolish as taking out the oil light or the engine light and turning it off and disconnecting it in your car. But the consequences are far greater. Another reason unbelief is evil is because it deceives. It deceives us. Again, verse 13, hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Sin fools us. It tricks us into thinking that we'll get something out of this this decision, out of this, this idea or this pathway that we're choosing, and that it will be delivered and we'll receive what we want. And that disobedience to God is not going to really have any impact in our lives. How foolish. 
Fifthly, unbelief is evil because it's inseparable from disobedience. In verse 18, those who failed to believe in God's victory to go in and take the promised land were disobedient, and so they received no blessing. They didn't enter into the rest and the promise of this place that was flowing with milk and honey. Instead, they spent the rest of their lives walking on hot sand. Can you imagine that? For 40 years, mindful of the fact that they failed because of their unbelief, because of their disobedience, because they would not step up and enter the land, they failed to enter and therefore dwelt in this, in this horrible, dry, and barren place. And sadly, Christians can do the same. You see, true saving faith is a faith that leads to obedience. It leads to obedience. And if you disbelieve God, then you will not obey God. If you believe God, then you will obey Him. It's that simple. Well, there's a third point that we need to see in this verse, in verse 12, and that is to avoid unbelief, we must focus on internal reasons, not external rituals. Christianity is a matter, he says, of the heart. Take care, he says, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart. Out of the heart, Jesus said, flows the rivers of life, the source of life, the things that are true of you as an individual. God is looking at the heart of his people. To obey from the heart is better than the sacrifice, an external sacrifice that one offers to God. So let's take care that we heed the warning to avoid the evil of the sin of unbelief. Well, that brings us to the second exhortation. So the, the first exhortation is let's take care that we don't walk into this realm of unbelief, that we avoid the sin of unbelief. But secondly, let's be urgent to encourage other believers. Verse 13, but encourage one another. And the word encourage here comes from the Greek word parakaleo, and it's a compound word para, meaning come alongside, and kaleo, meaning to call. It's to call alongside. And the author is commanding believers to come alongside others to help and to edify them and to build them up in their faith and their belief and their trust. And we see an example of this in the leadership in Acts chapter 14, when they were found, it says, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith. And we're saying, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. When life gets tough and it's difficult for you as, a, as an individual, as a Christian, you need the encouragement of others. And if you are to avoid unbelief and apostasy and the hardening of your heart, then we need to be urgent about the business, the service of encouraging one another. In fact, Paul writes uh, and, and to the Thess Thess Thessalonian believers, and he says, therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you also are doing. May that be true of Hickman Community Church. But back to our passage, Hebrews 3.13, the author gives us three specifics about this encouragement. He says we're to a, that we're, when we think of encouragement, we're to understand that encouragement is the responsibility of every believer. It says encourage one another day by day. He doesn't say leadership encourage. He doesn't say pastors encourage. He doesn't say elders encourage. He's talking to the church, and he's calling you as a member of Christ's church to encourage other members. It's the responsibility of all of us. If you see your brother being hardened 
by the deceitfulness of sin and you shrug it off in the hope that an elder or a leader will see it and address it, then you are not obeying this command. It's that simple. You see, it's one thing to spot someone who's struggling in the faith and then say to yourself, well, I I sure hope an elder will see it. To going up to that individual and coming alongside them with words of encouragement and helping them refocus and put their minds back on the Lord. So again, we are called here in this exhortation in this moral uh, exhort, in this in this exhortation to moral encouragement, and that this is the responsibility of every member of the body of Christ, not just the leadership. I remind you of Colossians three sixteen, which says, "Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you, with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another." I hope that you are sharing God's Word with other believers. I hope that you are encouraging others with the things that you're learning and discovering day by day as you spend time in His Word. You know, sometimes I I just need the exercise of this ministry in my life, and other times I need to exercise that ministry. Well, how often are we to do this ministry of encouragement? Well, he says day by day, as long as it's called today. It's, it's, it's a daily habit. Why daily? Because we are constantly facing the danger of discouragement. We are to habitually, day by day, encourage one another. And where does that discouragement come from? It comes from the, the fact that we're in a battle against an enemy. Satan and his demons are constantly attacking us through false teachings, through fleshly enticements, and through discouragements. And so just as Satan does not let up on his attacks, we must not let up on encouraging and exhorting one another in the faith. How long are we to exhort each other? We are to do it as long as it's still called today. And today here speaks of the day of God's grace, a period of time in which God is calling a people out for his own possession. This is the church Age. This is the day when God is calling people from every nation, tribe, kindred, and tongue to himself. And that, of course, reminds us, doesn't it, that there is a day coming when God's grace will come to an end in the way that we understand it. When the church is raptured out of this world and and the day of judgment begins. And knowing that should motivate you and me It should motivate us to want to warn others, to encourage others to press on in the faith. Jesus is coming back. But what's the purpose of this encouragement? It's so that, look at this in verse 13, it's so that, this is a purpose clause, none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of the sin. sin. Literally, it is of the sin. What is the sin? It's the sin of unbelief. Sin is deceitful, as I said before. A a deceived person cannot evaluate himself and the situation he's in properly. He's deceived. He thinks that everything is fine when it's not fine. And if you've ever been deceived by a con artist, he is long gone with your money before you realize that there was even a problem. That's what sin does. Paul says in Romans 7, 11, for sin, taking an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. Sin often deceives under the appearance of good things. This is why we have to be vigilant. It's not not like you and I come to church wearing a label that says, hey, I've lived all week under under deception. Can somebody out there help me and encourage me? No, that's not how we function. We're unawares of often the deception that we're under. We're unawares that there's unbelief in our hearts because sin fools us, it tricks us. We need each other. We need the perspective of others to come alongside us to give us this ministry of encouragement. Some resist the idea of people coming to them and encouraging them in the Word 
or pointing out something in their life that they are concerned about. And they resist it by saying something like this or thinking this. My faith's personal. It's a personal thing. Well, the answer to that is no, it's not. It's something individual that's true, but it's also something that's collective. You belong to a body. You belong to the body of Christ, and you are hopefully established in a membership base of a local church. This brings us to our third exhortation, to persevere in the faith. To persevere in your faith is there's great sin that we need to avoid, this great sin of unbelief. There's an urgent service to, per, to, to perform or to practice, to work out, and that's the service of encouragement. But thirdly, look at verse 14. There's an exhortation here, and the exhortation is that you and I are to hold fast to our faith in Christ. He says, for we have become partakers in Christ, if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. How do you know if you truly belong to Christ? How do you know if you're truly saved? Well, the answer is very clear in this text. It's if you hold fast the beginning, the foundation of your assurance firm until the end. What is that foundation? It's the foundation of the saving work of Jesus Christ. For there is no other foundation that anyone can lay, the Bible says, other than that which has been laid. And that's our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, true believers will persevere in the faith. They will persevere in these truths that they first believed in. And they will demonstrate saving faith in an ongoing way. Imperfectly, yes, but progressively. I'm not saying, I'm not saying that, um, that Christians will never doubt and never believe. That's the whole purpose of this passage. You will have doubts. You will at times have disbelief and a lack of trust in God in your heart. And, and, and what this writer is saying is if you want to persevere in the faith, if you want your faith to grow, if you want to know that you're truly in the faith, then be one who holds fast to Christ. Hold fast to him. He speaks about being partakers here of Christ. And this focuses on what God has done for us by his grace. But the if clause, that focuses on our responsibility. And it's our responsibility as believers to hold fast the beginning of the assurance firm until the end. And the beginning of our assurance refers to our initial faith in Jesus Christ for salvation. Saving faith, therefore, isn't just a one-time commitment or a one-time action or a one-time belief. It is, if it's genuine, then you're going to go on believing. You're going to go on acting on the promises of God until the time that you and I see Jesus face to face. Jonathan Edwards said it this way. He said, the sure proof of saving election is that one holds out to the very end. Now, what does that holding fast look like? Well, I think Paul in Ephesians 4 explains it in a very practical way. In Ephesians 4, 17 through 19, he points out that the way of unbelief, the way of distrusting God, the way that we all once walked in, includes the futility of our minds, the darkening of our understanding, ignorance, hardness of heart, callousness, sensuality, impurity, and greediness. But in contrast to that, the believer in verses 20 through 32 uh, it walks in the way of faith. And he says, of the believer, but you did not learn Christ in this way, in a way of unbelief. You learned by trusting. You learned by looking and believing and accepting what he said he had done, has done for us. If indeed, he says, you've heard him and have been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Ephesians 4, 20 through 24. 
In other words, we hold fast when by faith in Christ, when by faith in Christ daily, we put off deceit and unbelief and put our faith and accept the truth that Christ has revealed. By faith, we are to put off lying, which is an evidence of our lack of trust in Christ, and we are to speak the truth in love. We are to put off stealing, and we are to go and work with our own hands and provide for our own needs and the needs of others. We are to be a giver, not a taker. We are to put off unwholesome talk, and we are to put on words of encouragement and edification, building others up. And all of these new actions flow from being renewed in the spirit of our mind as by faith we lay hold of Christ who has laid hold of us. To persevere in faith, we must avoid the sin of unbelief, encourage one another, and hold fast to our faith by living it out. Well, that brings me to the fourth exhortation. And while this is not a, an exhortation in the text per se, it really fits into the realm of exhortation because this is all part of his exhortation. And, and, I, and I, I'll give you this one because I think, I think verses 15 to 19 are his conclusion. They summarize what he's saying. But what he's doing here is by way of exhortation saying to you and me and to his readers, learn from the failures of others. He says, while it is said today, if you harden your voice, do not you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me. He's looking back historically to the children of Israel. He's already mentioned this back in verse 7, and he's going back to it, and he's reminding them again, learn from what happened in the past. Now, he, he, he does this, this process of concluding his thoughts here by asking or going through three sets of Two rhetorical questions in each set. The first question is answered by the second. The first question we see in verse 15, in verse 16, is for who provoked him when they had heard? His answer, indeed, did not all those who came out of Egypt led by Moses? What's his point? What's he saying here? What does he mean by these two rhetorical questions? Well, the, he's saying this, that the very people that God rescued from Egypt, his covenant people, are the very ones who are disobeying him and disbelieving him. In other words, the God who gave them no reason to distrust them, him, the God who rescued them from slavery, the God who delivered them out from under the hand of Pharaoh is the God who they are distrusting and disbelieving. Unbelief is found amongst these people who were brought out from under slavery, were brought out under the blood of the Lamb by faith, who by faith set out to, to a promised land, who saw the miracles of God and received the law of God given through Moses. And the author is saying, if these people, if the nation of Israel can provoke God, so can we, the church. And listen, the church, the stakes for the church are much higher. What do I mean by that? Well, we are further along than they were. We have a greater revelation. We have a more perfect revelation. In fact, we have the complete revelation of God through the Son. It, if we think it's unthinkable that Israel would harden their hearts and not trust this God who delivered them through Moses, how much more unthinkable is it that we, the church, would not believe in the promises of God who rescued us from the slave market of sin through His precious Son? The second question that he comes to, the second point that he wants to make, the next set of rhetorical questions, he says, and with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? What's his point? His point is this. Sin produces God's 
judgment, God's discipline against his people. Why? Because unbelief, unbelief in God is an offense to the nature and the character of God. In Numbers 14, 20 through 23, it tells us that, yes, God forgave these people. He forgave their sin of not going up into the promised land. And yet, it tells us that an entire generation of covenant people died in the wilderness. Someone did their their math on this and said that meant that there were 90 funerals a day. 90 funerals every day for 40 years. Now this speaks, this discipline of God speaks to a physical reality. It speaks to physical death, not spiritual death. How do I know that? Because Moses himself died and did not enter the temporal promised land. Numbers 20, 12 through 13 tells us that. Yet we know that Moses was saved, and we know that Moses entered into that ultimate rest because we see Moses on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus Christ. Beloved believer, may disbelief not be true of our generation of God's people. May we not become hard of heart and full of unbelief and so incur the wrath of God against us. As Jesus said to to the church in Revelation, if you do not repent, I will come and war against you. May that not be true of Hickman Community Church. Or as we are warned as we come to a time of communion as a church that we judge the body rightly to examine ourselves because failure to do so could lead to death. Peter reminds us it's time for judgment to begin with the household of God, and it begins with us first. And he says, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? It's, it's, this, is a, this is a warning to us. This is an exhortation to us. God wants us to enter his rest, and so we need to learn from the the mistakes that Israel made. In question three, the last group of questions here, and to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest? Verse 18, to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest? But to those who were disobedient. What's his point? Well, the point is that the disobedient here are the Exodus generation. To enter the rest in this context has to do with entering the promised land, and the connection to the church is that of entering into a life lived in the power of the Holy Spirit, lived by faith. The word rest does not mean doing nothing. Rather, it speaks to having a confidence in another. And that's what faith does. Faith trusts in God. If faith, if faith trusts in what cannot be seen, it believes. And what does it believe? It believes that the death of Christ on our behalf is sufficient not only to secure our redemption, freedom from sin, to cover our sin, atonements, but it's also sufficient to sanctify us to set us apart for God, and to make us instruments of glory to God. And so the Christian is to have obedient faith. We're to act. We're to make decisions to put aside sin and to put on righteousness. We are to surrender to the power and the promptings and the revelations of the Holy Spirit given to us through His words. We are, as Paul says in Ephesians, to walk by the Spirit, to be under the control, filled with the Spirit. We are to enter into a Spirit-filled rest. Well, that brings us to the final verse, verse 19 which is the author's summary conclusion. He says, so we see that they were not able to enter because of unbelief. And again, what's shocking about this is to whom it is written. Israel, 
God's covenant people, instead of their hearts being soft to God for all His goodness and grace to them, instead, their hearts are hard. And if it was a problem for them, then dear believer, it's a problem for you and me. Just as they distrusted God and did not believe that God could root out their enemies and give them victory and bring them into this fullness of blessing, so too we are in danger of not believing that God can give us the strength to say no to our sin. And every one of us struggles with sin. And every one of us has to die daily to the flesh. And God says, I will give you the strength to overcome if you believe me. If you trust me, if you are caught up in sin, if you are bound up in sin, even right now, the reason is not because sin is more powerful than God. The reason is because you are not living by faith in God. You're not trusting in the power and the promise of God to give you the victory over that sin. Now, that's a lifetime process. I understand that. It doesn't happen in a moment, but it's moment by moment by moment by moment, day by day, walking out, living out the Christian life by faith in the power of God's Spirit. And if God dealt with the nation of Israel, including their leader Moses, in such harsh terms, why would we think that the church, who has been given so much more revelation than Israel through the Son, the one who's greater than Moses, why do we think we would be treated any differently in our unbelief? God, through Christ, has promised that we, through believing Him, will overcome our enemies. We will overcome our fleshly desires and the pull of the world and the work of the devil to discredit us. God's grace, dear friend, is sufficient, and it is God's power in the midst of of our weakness, and it is the only pathway to rest. May we trust completely in Jesus Christ. And may we as a church examine ourselves in light of these four exhortations. May we examine ourselves for the sin of unbelief and repent of it before God's judgment falls upon us. May we be vigilant both personally and corporately against unbelief. And may we encourage each other to greater faith as we grow in the knowledge of God through the Son. Let me finish by giving you uh, some applications to take away. Firstly, we must avoid the sin of unbelief because there are horrific consequences, personally and corporately, for the church. So examine yourself this morning. Let's commit. Would you commit with me to personally Be vigilant to take care of your own life and to look out for the lives of others. Would you keep a short account before God of sin and unbelief? Secondly, we need to be engaged in each other's life so we can fulfill the service of encouragement and exhortation. If you're new to this church or maybe you've just come online, I want to encourage you that that God calls you to be a part of this, of this body. He's calling you to be involved in people's lives. There's no such thing as isolation in the Christian life. We are to be invested in encouraging one another and all the more as we see the evil day approaching. And the church is made up of servants. And therefore, we are to serve. Who do we serve? One another. And in serving one another, we serve our God. Thirdly, third application, we need to connect with the many opportunities provided each month by the elders, the deacons, and the ministry leaders so that we may grow in our faith. And by growing in the knowledge of the truth, learning to overcome sin and putting off the ways of the flesh and unbelief. We have all kinds of activities that go on in this church. And while we're in this time of uh, stay at home under the stay at home order, These things are not in operation at the same level, but there's still opportunities. And we need to embrace them. We have equipping our classes for you to attend. We have junior high and high school Bible classes. We have home groups. We have men's studies and and women's studies. We have leadership training and evangelism training. All of these are ways that you'll find encouragement to persevere in the faith. 
So when the doors open again, may the longing to have fellowship, may the longing to fulfill this responsibility drive you to engage in every possible event that you can. But more than that, may it engage you in individuals' lives. Sunday morning services, worship services are are an essential part of this, but they're not sufficient in and of themselves to produce a maturing and a growing of, of one's faith. And so even in this time, even while we are under these stay-at-home orders, may we pick up the phone, may we, may we share our lives with others that we know in the church, may we encourage one another during this time. And lastly, as a practical application, let us learn, let us learn from the history of God's dealings with unbelief. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And so may we seek and may we strive through the power of the Spirit of God to be those who enter into the fullness of God's rest. And may everyone hearing this message know the true, that true rest of God, that it begins with faith in Christ. It begins by, by understanding and believing and trusting His death is sufficient to save us. And it begins by repenting of our sin and taking up a cross and following Him day by day, one step of faith, another step of faith, another step of faith, until we are ushered into the presence of our Lord. May these exhortations and applications impact our lives this week and in the weeks to come. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. And God, we come to you as a needy people. You know our hearts. You know the battle we have with sin. Sin of indifference. Sin of lust. Sin of the flesh. Sin of pride. Sin, Lord, that dominates our lives at times. And God, we've learned this morning that behind every sin is the greatest sin of all, the sin of unbelief. Lord, deliver us, I pray from not trusting you. Because God, there is no reason that we shouldn't trust you. There's no reason that we should embrace with with idolatrous thoughts and desires the things that are dead and lead to death. Because God, you are good to us. You are good in time and you are good in eternity. And Father, we long for that day when the Lord Jesus Christ will come back again and will gather us to himself and bring us into that beautiful kingdom, that paradise where there is no sin, no death, no suffering, no crying, no tears. Lord, where there's no need of the sun or the moon, where the glory of God fills that place. And Lord, we long to be there. Oh God, make that the longing of every heart today so that we live this day looking to Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.